all these chemotherapy drugs have a laundry list of fertility side effects. If we could find a way to find a solution for those women who want to conceive, but have been afflicted by cancer or something else, I see it as a game changer. Fertility issues are affecting millions of people globally. In most cases, a lot of those people are going through it on their own. This kind of research is more important to be supported now more than ever. A lot of women feeling like they're running out of time without even knowing it. And it's not even about having kids right. fertility science i believe is hey everyone welcome back to the show this is our inaugural episode um don't know what we're gonna call it but we both know that is going to be very successful. I think we can start with some uh, introductions before we get into the uh, meat and potatoes. Do you uh, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. So I'm if for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Carlin. I am a a PhD student at Northwestern. Uh, I'm really passionate about uh, innovation and you know cutting edge science uh, with a particular interest in like regenerative medicine. I love, uh, you know, nanotechnology. And uh, I'm particularly interested in like DSI and women's health as well. So excited to uh, get this podcast off the ground. Well, I am a recent graduate. I got my master's in biology, uh, currently working as a consultant in pharma and biotech. Um, what is really close to my heart is really that intersection between science and business. And really finding ways to 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 push, you know, ventures and ideas that are gonna redefine our existence as a, as a species. For a while, my side hustle was actually a kind of health slash hormone optimization coach, and I've I've worked with a lot of women on things like you know skin health, gut health, fertility, um, which mm. is actually the subject of our first podcast episode masterful transition right there masterful <laughs> i try i try my best <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it, it it really is something that affects millions of people but it's it, it's one of those closed door things you know fertility women's health and how science is is kind of stepping up to to tackle some of the biggest challenges in, in the space and it, i i think it's it's uh it's a topic that you and i feel really passionate about, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's one of those things where like, it's it's almost like a taboo to talk about. But when you think about it, like fertility issues are a lot more common than I think a lot of people would care to admit, you know, like globally, we're talking about like, uh, one in six people are facing some form of infertility uh, during their lifespan. And that's pretty big, because uh, like, even though there's a stigma or a shame around of it, a lot of people are going through this like struggle by themselves, which really, really breaks my heart. Yeah. And I I, I think to, to echo off of that, there's this, this like pressure, especially on women to, to keep it all private. Like there's this kind of societal expectation that, you know, it, it, it's someone, it's like a, a personal failing if, if you're struggling with, with fertility. And what's really crazy is that like, while the, the the pressure is is kind of still there, people don't really understand what's going on biologically, right? So you hear about this biological clock, but it's rarely what that really means and like how you can you know monitor. That's so true, and like honestly, the truth is like it's even not even a straightforward process, even when you're you're thinking about it from a clock point of view. Like there's all these different factors, like maybe you have like you're ge genetically predisposed to like your clock moves faster. Maybe you live a kind of risque lifestyle or something like that. Or there's even like, you know, people who are in more socioeconomically disparate situations that can kind of have their biological clock affected as well. Then there's things like ovarian aging, uh, which I think that we're going to talk about uh, more in a little bit. Uh, and that's where fertility can kind of decline a lot faster than you would even think, even in a perfectly, perfectly, I guess, normal situation here for a woman in her 20s or 30s. And, you know, it's not as simple anymore as saying, you know, you hit 35, then things start to change, you lose, you lose more eggs or something like that. For some women, those changes can come a lot earlier. And it's, it's really unexpected, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, that's where it gets really tough. You know, there, there's not always clear signs that something's changing, right? There's no like fertility alarm clock that kind of goes off to warn you. And that can leave, you know, a lot of women feeling like they're they're running out of time without, you know, without even knowing it. Right. And I think it's not even about having kids, right? Um, fertility science, I believe, is it's really about giving women more control over their reproductive health. And in some cases, it's it's really about being prepared for menopause as well, which is like a whole nother thing, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think my mom's gone through it at this point. Menopause itself is uh, such a huge shift that impacts women, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, and even like socially, like their friend groups and stuff like that start to get affected. It often catches women off guard because they're never really prepared for when it's that time. And since it's tied to ovarian aging, like we were mentioning, like there's not really even a moment when they may know when their time's their time's coming to an end of their fertility. So I think that, you know, maybe we don't even just need more research for women that are trying to conceive, like you were saying, like we need more better stuff for women's health overall. Um, yep. So if you understand maybe like ovarian aging a little bit better, then we can help women navigate all these different stages from, you know, adolescence all the way to uh, the closing of their baby window, so to speak. I mean, I think that's that's the reason why we need to push fertility science forward, you know, it, and I think it, it goes beyond just treatment. It's also about, you know, education and prevention. We need better tools, better biomarkers. And overall, I think just more research to, to help women make informed decisions about their bodies. And I think that's why, you know, we're, we're both so excited about the work that's, that's being done um, through Athena Dow, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. Yo, I love Athena Dow. They're like changing the whole like game of women's health research. So for anybody out there who may not be familiar, Athena Dow is a decentralized science community. They're all about giving the power back to uh, the people by funding scientific research through community-driven initiatives. Uh, last year, they decided to focus on fertility, uh, specifically ovarian aging, like we were mentioning earlier. Um, and they funded this researcher, Dr. Mario Cordero's project, to explore how the immune system might be involved in this process. And so uh, the research is happening at uh, Pablo de Olavide University in Spain. I may have butchered that, but we love you out there in Spain, Dr. Cordero. Big shout out to uh, Dr. Cordero, you know, our, our own Super Mario. Um, but yeah, I think he, he's not just a scientist. I think like there's he's he's someone who has a a personal connection to to the issue when i was reading kind of through the background materials um i think he and his wife struggled with fertility at one point and so oh. there's kind of that aspect that it's research that is really close to his heart you know he he's not just studying it for the sake of it right he's He's actually trying to to make a difference for for real people, and I think I think that's why Athena Dow saw alignment in that and 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 in his values, and ultimately kind of decided to fund him. That's awesome. I you know I I've heard about his story as well, and it always it always breaks my heart. Um, but you know his research, like it's it's groundbreaking stuff. Truly, like it's to kind of break it down for for any of our listeners out there. It's Concerned with the C gas sting pathway, which is a pretty crucial part of our uh, immune system. Typically, this this pathway is being activated when the body is trying to fight off our infections. Maybe it's responding to stress. Maybe in one of those you know disadvantaged populations, like we like we were talking about. Dr. Cordero's research is kind of showing us that when this path starts to get too much on its plate, it becomes overactive. It's actually accelerating ovarian aging. So this can lead to further inflammation. Um, and that's going to go ahead and like damage the cells that would be the ovaries, uh, especially these cells called granulosa cells, which are the ones that are essential for the development of the eggs. I mean, I find it crazy that a lot of diseases nowadays, we're kind of finding a link between the pathogenesis of that disease and kind of 
either localized or even systemic inflammation, right? And we usually kind of view inflammation, I mean, in this case, right, when we're talking about the uh, CS sting pathway, it, it, it's part of the body's kind of defense system, right? Right. But in the, in in the context of what we're discussing, it seems to be doing more harm than than good when this pathway, I guess, stays on for for too long. It's creating that, you know, chronic state of inflammation that seems to be speeding up the decline of um, egg, not only the, the, the quality, but but also the quantity. Right, man. And that's you need those. You need those good quality eggs. Um, <laughs> like. We, we got to do, we got to do something about this, but thankfully Dr. Cordero. The other day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The number of puns that we can make. Yeah. Yeah. Eggs in baskets, all that stuff. Um, but you know what <laughs> I was saying earlier, uh, the Dr. Cordero's research is like truly groundbreaking on this front because it's the first to really kind of like try to parse out this specific connection between this immune activation in ovarian aging. So far, it seems like one of their major discoveries is that when they block the pathway, you see that you're kind of able to slow down this aging process in the ovaries. They did um, experiments in mice, I think it was, and they found that in the mice that where they knocked out the sting like protein that was produced in the pathway, they saw even better fertility um, compared to the normal mice that were the same age, which I thought was pretty sick. Crazy stuff. Like it, it's like you're turning off a switch, right? So it's like without sting, the ovaries are kind of able to preserve more eggs. And the ones that are like remaining are healthier. I think the big question now is like, how can we apply these findings to humans? Right. That was like the foundational question that I've been asking myself ever since I started like an undergrad in biology, like six years ago, right? Like all throughout grad school, it's always like really cool, right? But like, how can we apply this to humans? Because honestly, if we can, it could be a game changer, right? Not only- Absolutely extending fertility, but also preserving in women who are going through stuff like, you know, chemotherapy or who are on these like very strong medications, whether it's like, you know, cancer drugs or or, or whatever. I was actually looking at like a, a breast cancer drug called um, her 2 And so it, it's known to uh, cause embryo fetal toxicity. And so, well, and all these chemotherapy drugs have like, you know, the laundry list of fertility side effects. So like, if we could find a way to find a solution for those women who want to conceive, but, you know, have been um, afflicted by you know, cancer or something else, this could, I see it as a, as a game changer, to be honest. Yo, definitely. And, you know, I'm, I'm really with you on that, like point about, you know, grad school, you want to take these things that you learned and apply them in a way where, you know, when I was when I was growing up, I felt like a scientific discovery could change the world. And I think we've got to get back to that, you know what I'm saying? Which I think kind of brings us to where we are right now in the in the kind of DSI landscape. We're seeing that Athena Dow and Dr. Cordero are really doing their thing. Um, and they're at a really cool, like exciting stage, I think, in the research where they've shown these promising results in the mice. Um, and so now they're moving it on to the next phase. And I think that the first round of funding from Athena Dow was like crucial for the Cordero lab to be able to uh, cover these initial experiments. Um, and then I think that maybe, you know, now it's up to maybe the, the, you know, the rest of the larger community to get them set up for that next round so they can push it to the next step. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think, I think this next phase is, is going to be all about continuing those those in vitro um, experiments you know those inhibitors that they've they, they've identified to kind of block the pathway and then kind of move on to test them out in um, in animal models um, with reduced ovarian reserves right to to see um, if these compounds can actually like, you know, preserve fertility when the, the ovarian reserve is, is already low. And I think, um, I think that would be massive to be honest. Yeah. yeah, that would absolutely, you know, that would help a lot of people. One in six, we said, right. That would, that would help one in six people in the, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. That's moving well, I mean, the needle a lot. Not, not trying to be a pessimist, but like, if you look at like, 
you know, the trends over time, like mm -hmm. back way back when it, it, it wasn't one over six, it was like, well, one over 10, one over 20. And I think it's, I mean, you know, it, being realistic, it's, it, it'll probably be like a one over four, one over three, if we don't do something about it. If you look at like, even modern lifestyle, like the way we eat, the way we interact with our environments, the numbers of like, you know, environmental contaminants and toxins that we have that we bathe in constantly, like even even the water that you bathe in and, and drink, right? Microplastic, right. all that stuff is is, yeah. is not any favors, you know? No. Um, what's, the, what's the saying? Uh, everything gives you cancer? Well, yeah. it, I mean, yeah. it's also possible yeah. that everything could be reducing your ovarian reserve, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there you go. What, what else can we say? I mean, I think I think it's it's really cool because even the it's even the fundraising it's not um, it's not fundraising in the in the traditional sense, right? Yeah, I guess um, you know the the traditional sense. You know, you you do all this like pitching to a bunch of big companies, and maybe they maybe they think that your idea is good, but you know this way. Um, Athena Dow, I think, is going to be pushing something called IP tokenization, um, and that's where they are able to like actually tokenize the IP, the intellectual property produced from these projects. And what that means is, when you support the project, you're not just donating, but you actually own like a piece of the research. We always talk about how science is too mysterious; it's too it's too mad scientist in a lab. And all the people, all the, you know, the little people that didn't go and get these billion dollar degrees don't know, don't know what's going on and they're just getting tricked. But, you know, with this, when you support, like the community is getting to help govern this project. They're able to make the decisions with the researcher and with the, you know, the uh, sponsoring entity. And, you know, they're, they're able to be part of the journey the whole way. It's like decentralized science to the T. By the people for the people that's right that's, on brother right on <laughs> it's it, you know it, it, it it's science that belongs to the people and i with this next round they're looking to raise seventy five thousand dollars to keep the research moving forward so to anyone watching if you're interested in being part of something that's not only pushing fertility science forward, but also changing the way research is funded and governed, honestly, this is your chance. Yeah. And I think that, you know, this, like we were saying, this, this kind of research is more important to be supported now more than ever. Um, like we said at the start, you know, fertility issues are affecting millions of people globally and, you know, in most cases, a lot of those people are going through it on their own. Um, but through these initiatives and through, you know, bolstering the community through like, you know, working with Athena Dow, um, we can work together and, you know, create a even stronger, like more tight knit community around these things, around these issues and create real solutions and real, real change for women who, you know, society maybe tells them that their time's running out, like not anymore, you don't have to. 100%. I, I think it's 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 about giving women ultimately kind of more control over their their reproductive health and their and their future, you know, whether it's for family planning or, or, or managing menopause, I think that it could have a, an enormous impact. And I think the fact that it's community driven just makes the deal all the more sweeter. Yeah. And it's it's not just about funding, you know, a lab somewhere and you never get to know what happens after after you go in. How many times have we seen, you know, like Theranos where all these investors got involved and, you know, and then they were like, oh, yeah, where's the results? No results. No results. Um, and that's because, you know, the I investors understanding like how that like how they were bro, able to. Bro. You watch the documentary. I watch the documentary and I'm I'm turning to my family the whole time. Like, like how many movies? Was, this would me. never work. This would never work. <laughs> oh, but you know, God. the this this project is better, and you know these types of projects I think are better because that since the community is shaping it, there's side there's a, like accountability on the on the count of the researcher and whoever's you know putting the money in the the sponsors. So you know they're making decisions on what the next steps are, how it's applied. So in order to do that, they need to know like what the results are. And so now we're getting more science that is open, transparent, and, you know, driven by 
things that the community really wants to support, which is sick. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we're we're definitely at a, a pivotal moment in 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 Desai, um, where it's it's not just kind of the new and 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 exciting, um, but it's it's also kind of making making science uh, accessible to to everyone. You know, it's it's that cutting edge research that you know you can build a product, a tangible product that works but also getting the the community involved you know i I think how long are you gonna depend on on the market to 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 innovate right i think uh it starts with uh with you and me and uh that's that's how you make a a real difference honestly absolutely and you know if you're out there watching we want you to be a part of the journey too you know it starts with me and amin and it continues with the rest of y'all (laughs) <laughs> um so you know keep it locked in with our channel on how you can get involved in the next phase of dr cordero's project uh with athena dow um subscribe to our newsletter follow us on social media um keep an eye out for the upcoming crowd sale so that you can be the one that's actually playing a role in pushing this work forward and helping you know women and families everywhere for sure yeah i mean you know Thank you everyone for for tuning in. We are super excited about what's ahead and we hope that you all are too. And uh yeah, until uh until next time. See you next time. Peace. Peace.